It's no secret that writing can be lonely work, but does it really have to be? Whether you're full-time, part-time, or just starting out, you'll get insights into the tricks, tips, and production habits of writers from every level of the biz. From best-selling authors to those launching their first novels, you're sure to be in the company of friends as we encourage great writers to divulge and share their secrets. This is The Great Writer Share Podcast with your host, best-selling author, Daniel Wilcox. Hello and welcome to the Great Writer Share podcast with me, Daniel Wilcox, where every week I hijack an hour or so of time from some of the kindest and hardest working writers around today to join me on the show and discuss everything that makes them tick, raw and bounce. Uh, today's date is Tuesday, the 3rd of March, as of recording. Um, obviously, you guys will be listening to this on Friday. Uh, and I'll jump straight into my personal update for this week. Uh, a nice short one. Uh, one thing just ahead of this week's interview with the wonderful Brandon Ellis uh, is you will notice that, or you might not notice, but um, keen listeners will notice that my throat is going and that I had a bit of a sore throat during this interview. But um, I don't think it's anything that should affect what you hear too badly. And as you can hear, I'm much better now. So uh, onwards and upwards, there's no plague and I'm not going to be dying soon, which is wonderful. <laughs> uh, another highlight from this week for those interested in getting any merchandise from the show, we now officially have Great Writer Share podcast merch in which you can purchase at www.danielwilcox.com forward slash merch. Uh, and then on there, there's a, a nice section for um, where you can get the merch from. So that, I'll put a link in the show notes because I think it's actually a slightly different link. I'll make that easier for people for, for next time. But we've got T-shirts, we've got three-quarter T-shirts, baseball shirts, we've got hoodies, we've got uh, travel flasks, we've got, what else we got, notebooks and phone cases as well. So anyone that wants to rep the Great Writer Share brand, that stuff is now available. Go help yourself. Uh, I think it looks fantastic. I'm very, very happy with it. And I've got a few ideas for new designs that will come out in the following weeks, uh, which I think will be a bit more playful, a bit more fun, and potentially something that will... Um, hopefully, I mean, my aim with this merch, uh, I know I joked around last week about myself just wearing my own product, which is a part of it, but my aim with this merchandise is to create products that will inspire writers to continue to write and do the thing that they want to do. Um, I know that personally for me, I've got a t-shirt that has uh, the logo of my other podcast that I do with the Hawk and Cleaver guys, the other stories, uh, on, and every time I put that shirt on, I just feel driven, I feel inspired, I, I know what I'm working towards, and it's that kind of stuff that even though it's only, it's tricking your brain, but it's a whole mentality battle most of the time um, in order to write and this stuff could help you. So uh, www.danielwilcox.com forward slash merch forward slash GWS or just go into the merch tab at the top. Uh, and my final little bit of an update is, I am knackered. <laughs> I'm not going to take up the whole of this very, very uh, enlightening interview episode because Brandon is so, so positive. It's fantastic. Um in, in negatives, but I, I have quite a few interviews this week. So if I sound a bit worn, if I sound a bit tired uh, during this part, then forgive me, I'm I'm powering through. Um, and I've got very exciting interviews this week, which uh, for those on the Facebook group and in the Patreon groups, you'll know who's upcoming and you can ask those guest questions. So why not get involved? Last week's question I asked at the end of the podcast uh, was, what is your ideal release schedule with your books? And I've had a few responses from different people, so um, I'm just going to read a couple out and share the love. So the first one, which has uh, just disappeared from in front of me, give me a second, there we go. Uh, the first one is from Dawn Chapman, um, hi Dawn, who says, my writing process is around 100,000 words a month, my edit process is 13 points, and it takes around another two to three months to edit. Uh, but while writing, well, while the edit and reading is going on, I'm usually writing more, so it's all about storing, banking, juggling. Um, at least in her world. But it's definitely true. I think uh, no matter how much you write, there's definitely a, a whole component there about juggling. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, Meg Cowley, uh, former guest on the show, says, as an epic fantasy author and knowing my process, I can write and release about three to four books a year. I leverage mo multiple platforms and revenue streams to produce a full-time income. Uh, thank you for that, Meg. HB Line, who will be coming on the show uh, in the next few weeks, actually, with her partner, Angeline Trevener, uh, said, so far I've published a book a year. I really want to increase that to three to four a year as a somewhat realistic output for my life and process. Um, fantastic. Thank you very much, HB, uh, for sending that over. It's really weird when you say people's uh, initials on their first names, but thank you very much for sending that in. Um, 
I think it's definitely interesting to sort of see the, the range of what people are, are going for. Um, one thing that I did forget to mention, which I'll quickly tap on in Dawn's, is that she has written a uh, present around 10 books and 300,000 word in shorts ready for 2022 releasing. Um, I know that I personally am crap at try, <laughs> trying to look that far ahead at what I'm releasing. I'm kind of just about keeping it together with what I've got going on in the next six months. So kudos for you to having uh, so much plan for the next couple of years. But on to today's guest, who is the wonderful Brandon Ellis, as mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation. Brandon is someone who I met in Edinburgh last year, and he's just a very, very interesting guy, very um, positive, very uplifting. Um, he's very ambitious. He's doing some wonderful things. And we definitely get down into the nitty gritty of mentality, all the kind of uh, mindset stuff that I absolutely love. Um, we... Brandon shares his top tips for marketing box sets, which was hinted at in Craig Faulkner's interview a few weeks ago. So if you want to actually get down into the nitty gritty from uh, and hear it from the horse's mouth himself, stick around. Um, he talks about embracing mentorship and tutelage. Brandon's one of these people that's never been afraid to ask others what they're doing and to also help those who are slightly behind on the journey um, to put their way forward. And that was definitely evident in preparing for this interview in which I've had quite a few authors reaching out and saying how excited they were because of the encounters they've had with Brandon and how positive he's been uh, and enlightening on, on their own lives. And then we go a lot into vision boards. Um, now, for anyone who might be going to this interview sort of maybe dreading this kind of mindset mentality stuff. Number one, that's what this podcast is about. So what are you doing? Uh, <laughs> I'm joking. Stay back. Um, but we definitely go deep into the mechanics of how vision boards can help, the sort of mindset boosting that it does, how to build confidence um, and all that ancillary stuff, which isn't exactly writing, but definitely is what you need to do to push you towards your goals. Uh, so yeah, we go deep into that and I absolutely love every second. No new patrons this week. But uh, for anyone who is interested in supporting this show, you can go over to www.patreon.com forward slash great writers share, where you can support the show for as little as $1 a month. Um, there's lots going on going on there at the minute. The monthly giveaway for March has been announced, um, which is Becca Symes, Dear Writer, You Need to Quit. Uh, Becca will be coming on the show in the coming months, and this is definitely a book that I've raved about on this podcast before. It's fantastic. It's, uh, yeah, it's everything that you need to work out why it is that you write and to work out your optimum schedule. So that's going to be a good one. Uh, one lucky winner will be pulled from the uh, pool of people between the Facebook group and the Patreon group. Patrons get increased entries into the competition so they have uh, higher odds of winning. Um, and I have also posted over February's Q&A video into the Patreon group. So for everyone who has sent over their questions, thank you very much. They're all answered and up on the Patreon feed. Um, and for anyone who wants to join the Facebook group, I'll put a link to that in the show notes for you. But without any further ado, I'm going to dive straight into the interview with the one and only Brandon Ellis. Brandon Ellis is the best-selling author of the Mars Colony Chronicles, Ascendant Chronicles and many more sci-fi works. Brandon grew up on the outskirts of Portland, Oregon. After being declared an All-State Baseball and All-League Basketball player, he obtained a state and federal therapeutic massage license to become a successful sports massage therapist and instructor. During his life adventures so far, he has become a father of three and a successful author and has recently taken the plunge into moving to Bali. After his family, Brandon has three great loves in his life. Writing, helping people re regain their optimal health and creating exciting new board games. Brandon, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you so much. No worries. Um, first question I want to dive into, just because this one caught my attention, is uh, as someone who has recently, and I say recently in the last sort of six months, really started to get into sort of the board game culture and to see what's about there. Um, what is it about board games that you love so much? Oh, I've been playing my entire life. Um, I actually, my favorite game, and it's not a board game, what kind of you can play it on a board, is Battletech or Mech Warrior. It's okay. kind of a role playing type of game. Um, that's my favorite, but uh, I really got into Battlestar Galactica board game. Uh, oh gosh, oh, uh, Lords of Water Deep. Uh, just so many. I've been playing with my sister my entire life, and nice. and every Wednesday when I I'm in Bali right now, but every Wednesday when I'm in the states, uh, we go to uh, a board game place and we play board games for three to four hours. It's a blast. Mm. And in the background, you might it thunders and lightning and rains here so much in the background you might hear that okay um so but the, the board game thing i i wrote that i need to fix that i wrote that um <laughs> that bio 
when I first became a writer. That was like six years ago. Mm. And at that time, I created a board game, and it was featured at this uh, game board or board game, whatever you call it, a game con. Um, and uh, I, it was it was just something I did one time, and I thought I was going to keep going and doing it, and and I didn't. Oh, okay, so <laughs> I fell off the wagon a bit. Sticking with yeah, I'm sticking with sci-fi books and sticking with playing board games rather than making them. Mm. I can so, imagine yeah. it's really. I can't even imagine where to begin in making a board game. Oh, it's a it's a long time. You have to spend years going mm. over and over and over it with it's it's a lot of testing, a lot of mm. testing. Yeah. So for my listeners who may not be um, so much aware of your journey, are you happy to give sort of like a brief overview of what got you into writing and where your journey has brought you to this point? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I've been writing my, my entire life uh, in like sixth grade. Uh, we had, you know, where you get together at the school and you make, or at, in a class and you make your, like we made like three or four books that year. And Apparently, my books were so well done that the teacher said she wanted to keep them to show her future classes. So she kept them. There's three books she kept. Then in eighth grade, we did something simi- similar, but we spent a week on um, learning how to bind books and all that stuff. And then we created the book. And I did a book called Pluto's or Penguins on Pluto. And <laughs> it, was, it was a sci fi. Um, and uh, it was so well liked that the teacher bussed me around the school dr- district and had me read it to younger children, like at elementary schools and stuff. Amazing. And, uh, and it was published in 2007 by, uh, oh, what are they, uh, kind of a famous publisher in um, the Portland, Oregon area, the uh, Blue Heron Publishing. And didn't do anything. I mean, it sold some, but uh, it didn't do much. Uh, Anyway, that's how I kind of got started. And then in 2012, I started writing my first books, and they're terrible. <laughs> I wouldn't read them if I were you. Uh, I thought I was going to be on Oprah and pitching my books and be a millionaire. I thought that's how good of a writer I was. Little did I know as I stunk. So I spent many years improving my craft, learning how to market. I spent a lot of time... Uh, researching, reading craft books, reading marketing books, and bothering the 20 books to 50K crowd. Because I, I joined when there was barely, when there was, oh, maybe, I think, and I could be wrong, maybe 300 people in there, or maybe it's 3,000. It wasn't that many. And it was, uh, you know, kind of the best of the, of the best at the time. And I kept messaging them until somebody would actually answer me, answer these questions. And Craig Martell, if we all know him, he answered all my questions. Um, and then I decided to write Medium articles uh, on yeah. medium.com. Uh, and I approached authors, uh, best-selling authors that sold you know, upwards of $20,000 a month and just interviewed them and uh, put it on medium.com. And yeah, that's how I learned. Um, I don't even know if that answered your question. <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, it, it gets us to this point. Um, one thing that uh, you mentioned there that I definitely sort of want to pick up on is um, you, well, let me jump back. So in 2012, you put out some books. You say that they stink. I haven't read them, so I'm not going to give an opinion. <laughs> um, but you yeah. say that they stink. What is it that kept you spurred on in that moment into thinking, I can get better, I can get better? Because for a lot of people who have written their first book or are on that verge of, of publishing or are scared to press a publish button, I think that's such a, a roadblock that people hit in which that's kind of, it, it's everything in that moment. And if it does sink, then they just go back to whatever it was they were doing. What is it about um, your experience that kept you pushing forward and thinking, I can get better, I can make this happen? I think that's just how I am. Um... What I'm trying to figure out what would I just throughout my life, uh, like as a sports therapist before I was a before I was a, a, a author, uh, and uh, before that I worked at Intel, and uh, each time I wanted to learn these jobs so well that I could master them. Not that that I, that I ever did master them, uh, but I ended up doing kind of going what you consider kind of the top in the, in the industry or the top in the field, like 
Um, at Intel, I was the lead tech within, gosh, I don't know, a year of being there. Nice. And um, at sports therapy, I, and I don't want to say that we're successful because of money. Uh, money is one way of success, but I was able to, I was kind of the top 1% in my area, which is Northwest, Northwest uh, United States. Uh, as in I was making good living and I was helping a lot of people because I wanted to learn the techniques that didn't just make you feel better, but actually I can't say this word. Well, now I can, cause I'm not a sports therapist anymore that fix their issue rather than just, Oh, I feel good. And the next day later, they're not there, you know, hurt mm -hmm. again. Um, so I spent that time learning that. And I think I did that with authoring, uh, with authoring, it was a more of a difficult transition because I had so many naysayers, so many people telling me that I can't write. And I'm talking editors, I'm talking um, uh, even, oh gosh, uh, college scholars who read wow. my stuff. And if you did read my stuff back then, you know, I, I, if I read it, I'd be very hesitant on telling me to continue this career. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that pushed me forward to really figure out how to write in the craft because I really wanted to know because... Writing is my most favorite passion. It's what I love to do. And that's more than games, um, uh, more than sports therapy, all the other stuff that I've done. Writing is what I love because I just love creating worlds. I love characters. And I want to do so well that uh, I'm also on top of the, the sci-fi reading game or the sci-fi writing world as well. Not just because it's going to bring lots of money, but so I can know that I can continually, continually do this. And I'll know that uh, this is probably the, the right career path for me. So mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of where I am. Plus, I have a need to help people. And I would love to do so well that I can really help even financially my fellow authors that are struggling and that are even better than I am, but just don't have that marketing uh, not background, but marketing, I don't know, thoughts or the marketing mm -hmm. brain, like, like I kind of do. I don't have a marketing brain, but I do better than a lot of others because I want to figure it out. It's so. definitely a lot of hats to wear because obviously you've got the business side, you've got the marketing side, you've got the actual writing side itself. Um, yeah. And yeah, I guess that certain people lend their strengths better towards um, certain areas. Where would you say that you are strongest? Um, networking. Mm -hmm. uh, I love people, so I think that comes across to some people, and I'll help them, and they'll help me. I think that's what I'm best at. So uh, when I have craft questions and I ask um, a fellow author, I'll get an immediate response faster than I think other authors would because um, I will help anybody immediately as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think I'm better at creating worlds and writing characters and creating outlines and writing books than I am marketing. However, it's uh, kind of evening out, I think. Especially, I'm taking Chris Fox's uh, course right now, his ads course, and yeah. the results are remarkable. It's, it's night and day. Um, okay. At first, you know, the first three days, it wasn't much change, but Okay, and I, I'm just doing one book, my uh, Martian Plague, which I haven't uh, advertised for quite some time. And I'm just doing Martian Plague, which is book one of the Martian Colony Chronicles. And um, there's five to six books, and that is actually six, but the six isn't yet published. I got to get that published. And uh, I've taken his ads course. The first three days was, you know, nothing was changing, but now I'm seeing the, the page reads. Holy Toledo. <laughs> it's, totally, it's it's uh, it's a huge change a huge jump and knock on wood i hope it stays that way so yeah and i'm not even i'm doing his i'm using his techniques and what he's teaching and i'm doing test ads so i'm not spending much on them and i can't imagine how much it would actually increase my page reads and my book buys if I do what he suggests, or not what he suggests, but what I think, would, if I just put it down $100 a day on advertising for this book, mm -hmm. I'm only doing about 20 bucks a day. So I think that's, that's 
anyway good thanks. results no I'll, uh, I'll definitely put a link to uh, that in the show notes for anyone that wants to check out some yeah, of yeah uh, chris Chris's. fox is yeah he's he's a great great teacher yeah well let's talk a bit more about mentorship because i think uh, already that that was something that i definitely wanted to bring you on to talk about and it's something that i think is already coming uh, across quite a lot within the stuff that we're talking about um and i kind of want to go both ways between you reaching out and talking to people and obviously people coming out and talking to you um and you obviously uh, teaching and imparting wisdom what is it about um whether it's your personality or sort of the indie community itself or um, just being in the writing community generally, that you found it, have you, did, I mean, did you find it easy to reach out initially and start asking um, people for advice? Because I know that in my experience, I found people incredibly receptive just reaching out and asking. And yeah. a lot of the stuff that I've been doing has come out of the result of me just reaching out and asking and not, not expecting yes. anything back, but just seeing where that relationship goes. The easy answer is yes. Um, mm. uh, with everything, I reach out. Um, if, like, I just reached out to an author, very, very well-known author, and uh, two days ago, uh, with a question I had, he doesn't know me from Adam, and uh, I did not receive a response. <laughs> but <laughs> that's me. I just, I just reach out, and I'll probably, in, in a week or so, I might kind of shoot him a little short message, like maybe he saw it and didn't. And forgot to respond. I yeah. doubt it, but <laughs> but we'll see. So yeah, I um, I have no problem reaching out to people uh, in person. That's a little bit different because I'm actually pretty shy. I don't talk as well as I write, uh, so I can you know with writing you can write something down, read it, edit it, read it again, edit it. I can't really do that with speaking, so I'm pretty shy um, at the conventions we go to or at least i go to the 20 books to 50k uh i do my best to talk with people uh there's a lot of at least sometimes a lot of pausing and a lot of uh uh well no talking because i don't really know what to say <laughs> all the time. so yeah uh in person i'm a lot less mm, speakable than i am when i'm writing to you mm. so maybe that's a lot of people i don't know yeah and how how fundamental would you say that the mentorship was for you actually sort of getting to the point where you are now and starting that journey into writing? The mentorship? Hmm. Are you saying the mentorship? Is that what you said? So Sorry. it's not, so not sort of like a actively one person coaching you, but there's a sort of mentorship of opening it up and trying to oh. reach up to those who have obviously gone slightly ahead on your journey. It's everything. I'm, I'm not the most uh, terribly smart individual. Uh, I learn a lot by watching others and I learn a lot by, uh, the success of others because success leaves clues and I kind of watch and observe and a lot of times do what they do but with my spin a lot of us do that we put we watch what other people do and we're all individually different individually unique and we put our own spin on our on on their style we put our own style into it so that's what I do uh, with writing however I think I'm different than most because I take huge chances I write what I want, not necessarily what the readers probably want. <laughs> Sometimes it works out very well. Sometimes I'll have books like my Atlantis series with a 3.3 star rating. <laughs> because I mixed fantasy with, with um, you know, science fiction, not mm. warning anybody. And it's, it wasn't the best. But the people who loved it, are huge followers of mine and fans and you know i just will be more careful next time <laughs> mm. so yeah uh, yeah and and mixing fantasy and sci-fi i'm actually i uh my own personal i did, actually didn't enjoy that i think um maybe doing a little bit of fantasy mixed with sci-fi is okay but for me i'm more i want to research this the the science and figure it out and make it more sci-fi than fantasy so mm. so those are my future books nice and let's go a little bit uh, the other way so uh, we've spoken a little bit about obviously reaching out to people um and i'm imagining that obviously as your success has sort of grown you've had people reach out for you and um i won't mention names but i have had a handful of people ahead of this interview really singing your praises um one of my guests who came on the show a few weeks ago spoke specifically about you and how you'd helped them with box sets and oh wow how that oh, yeah, has yeah, had cool. a, yeah and how that had a, a significant impact on on his sales um how do you approach 
uh, helping those who are on their journey, maybe a few steps behind you. I know that you sort of... I can't <laughs> wait. <laughs> when, when somebody is explaining to me what they want to do and I know from past that worked or didn't work um, and I know what would work, like when um, somebody at Edinburgh came to me and told me that they're going to be doing a, a uh, box set, uh, I do very well with box sets. Um, I think a lot of people do, but I was, I did something a little bit different than bo- with box sets than other people did, and it just took off. And so um, I explained to this writer what I did, and I think he got help from Rami as well, and I think yeah. some other writers. And um, uh, he did even way better than I did. <laughs> um, so yeah, he's. It, it, I, I just love helping. Um, and there are people that I've reached out to. Uh, actually, yeah, I've reached out to and, and told them. I was like, they're doing another person who's well-known. He does, I won't mention his name. Uh, he w- did a box set, and he did it in a certain way that I wouldn't have done it. And it didn't work out for him like I thought it wouldn't. But, you know, I, I want him to do his best. I even shared the, the books and all that stuff with my newsletter. And a year later, he finally did what I told him to do. And it, it was e- even better than the person I showed or I told what to do in Edinburgh so, and better than me. And, you know, it's, it's kind of cool stuff. Yeah. So my, I like to share. Yeah. My, my listeners will kill me if I don't ask if you're happy to share whatever that advice is. Oh, okay. Um, so Chris, <laughs> Chris Callius uh, came up with the idea. So I, I wanted to put together – here's one thing that I, I did that did well. Mm. Um, I want to put a box set together that was uh, a quadrilogy. Um, there was the word quadrilogy going around there, but I don't know if it was in sci-fi. I'm not sure. Um, Chris Callius came up with the idea of let's make this call this call this um, what do we call it? Atlantis quadrilogy is what he called it. And then he he built me. I wanted to have because in the past you'll have these books that have. Um, you know, it'll show, I forget what, like the 3D version where it shows all the books mm. um, in that. And I just was like, you know, I want this to be a short, I want this to look just like a regular novel. Um, I will put box set in the description, but I want it to be a regular novel so it hits hard in the newsletters. I know box sets would, but I, do, I, I just wanted it to, to, look, to look normal. Like... And so I had one cover. That was it. Just one cover. Mm. Different cover than the rest, but it's called Atlantis Quadr- Quadrilogy. I had a very short, um, to the point uh, blurb, one that I went through several times with people helping me with those. And I wanted it short. I didn't want what other people had, which also still works. Mm. But this is just different. This is how I am. Um, a lot of people would have like book one description, book two description, book three description, book four description. I wanted one description for it all as if it was just one book but i did have in there that this is you know thousands or so pages and and this is a box set so that's one thing that i did that was different um the other thing was um how i marketed it and uh you know i did the facebook the amazon ad stuff uh but very little and um i kept it at 99 cents and i I did it purely because it was in Kindle Unlimited and I was going for page reads. I did the 99 cents because I could keep bolstering it because it was inexpensive. And I could keep um, sending it through newsletter swaps um, and all that stuff and uh, BookBub ads. And um, I know I didn't do BookBub ads for that. No. So anyway, um, yeah. So that's kind of what I did. At the time, it was three or four or five, three, probably three. I don't know how many. It was years ago. By the time it was kind of unique, it might not have been, but to me it was unique and I think different and not every sci-fi author knew about it. And uh, I I told a couple and it really worked for them. Mm. Um, uh, But Chris Fox may have already been talking about it years before I did. Um, And I'm sure because I'm by no means uh, a trendsetter in that kind of way. I just kind of had this idea, I thought it would work and it would work. And I did it with uh, another box set, which again, took off and it was great. Um, the thing is, what I don't like, what I wish, I, I'm glad it worked for me. 
the what I'm not enjoying now is it's turning into a box set culture. I think I might be wrong, but it could be. And we're launching books. They aren't doing as well as they used to, but then you have the series done and you throw out that box set and boom, that's when the, the, the sales come. And so it's almost like people are expecting I, to wait for that box set at the yeah, end. Yeah. And, and it's, it's kind of, I'm not enjoying that as much. <laughs> mm. I just kind of wish it was the way it was before. Mm. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. I guess it's a bit more difficult then because if, if that is the case and obviously before with each book comes enough success that it's a step up the ladder and you can see those instant results and yeah. it's looking more at the long game as opposed to sort of yeah. the shorter game at that point. Um, yeah. How, how are you so confident giving advice? Cause um, in terms of the indie landscape, I mean, I've been involved in it since 2015 and I've seen sort of a thousand different changes. Um, is there yeah, ever a fear in you that a piece of advice you're going to give isn't quite going to work or is it, or do you really sort of like strike home on the things that you are super confident in? No, I, I'm, I don't, I don't fear that because I think we all know that it changes constantly. Um, uh, I follow a lot of Chris Fox's stuff and even stuff that he said in the past has kind of changed and tweaked and he's tweaked his message a little bit. Um, uh, from advice he given in the past is, you know, okay, this has changed a little bit in the Amazon ads. This has changed a little bit with Facebook ads, that kind of stuff. Um, ultimately I think, we are not competitors in this industry and my a lot of my advice comes with networking with sharing with other authors getting our um books out to their newsletters having them share and we share for theirs um a lot of my success comes from that and i don't think that will change i think that's just going to get bigger and bigger and better so that's usually a lot of my advice newsletter swaps <laughs> yeah uh uh the advice i give for um, the box sets. Um, I don't know. I, I don't, I just don't, I don't have that fear of it not working or mm -hmm. if I, if it doesn't work, I don't think since I'm not charging at all for this, mm -hmm. I, I don't think they're going to, they're going to cut my throat for it, especially if, since they came to me for the advice. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Why do you think uh, news that swaps are still so effective? Because I've seen, um, I don't know if you've seen similar, I've seen a growing trend of people who are, almost questioning the premise of building the newsletter list and wondering if it's still worth it. Um, 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 I, th I think it's taken a, a turn a little bit uh, for the lesser. I don't think it's doing as well as it used to. Um, I think it's because, again, this is, these are my opinions, and I, I'm, mm -hmm. I, I keep saying this. I could be wrong. Uh, I think we oversaturate our s newsletter swaps now with sharing multiple two, three, four books at, at a time. Um, I share one. I do as and, well. And I prefer to have mine be exclusive on another person's newsletter swap list uh, or newsletter list. And um, I sometimes that happens, but on rare occasions. Uh, and, uh, and when you're that fourth slot in that newsletter, depend on maybe a dozen sales. Mm. It's, it's just not, it's not worth it. Um, so what's happening now with me is uh, I launch, for some reason I do well with the BookBub ads. Uh, another author, uh, Patrick McLaughlin, uh, he taught me really well how to do uh, BookBub ads. <laughs> He's super smart. Um, and uh, uh, he goes by the name of Killian Carter as, a, as an author. Uh, but he, he taught me a lot and, um, oh, uh, actually Rami taught me a lot as well. And I, I, uh, when I launch a book for the first week or two, I push BookBub ads a lot as well. And it, as, as well, and I say as well, is because I use news, uh, I use Facebook, Amazon and newsletter swaps. I kind of use them all. The thing that I've, I've kind of stopped doing and I'm going to get back into his promo sites. I don't know if you know, those are like book barbarian yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, book sends and stuff like that. I'm going to get back into that. Cause I think, uh, even though those readers may not read your books, it still will help push the ranking up higher and you'll get more s looks on Amazon. And, mm. and uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, and, and I think newsletters, 
will start to get better again because email is something that's been constant. It's been around and uh, I, total guesstimation, I think it's going to start doing better again. I think it'll have its ups, ups and downs like probably mm-hmm. most things do. Uh, so I'm going to keep doing those newsletter swaps. Yeah, I wonder if there's also an element of, um, and this is partly guesswork, partly um, from from what I've seen, but whether there's an element of people who are trying to do the quick builds, the quick sales, are creating these sort of rapid put together newsletters, spamming obviously their their audience. But then you'll have this yeah, way yeah. people who are a bit more careful, a bit more curated, and and work more on building the trust relationship between their readers. And yes. you might find that some of those lift, and some of those obviously drop off over time. And the the readers will find the ones that they really sort of get the most out of that they want to yeah so i have a unique group of readers um i have a here's something that i learned (laughs) Um, and i'll get back to what i was about to say um uh again chris callius taught me this he uh, do you know chris callius at all he's a a, oh he's a best-selling sci-fi author and he does all of my uh covers book covers he's incredible and uh, he said, so I was using Brandon Ellis writes at gmail.com as my send on mailer light. Mailer light was my newsletter. So is my newsletter service and my send and receive and all that stuff. And I was getting, I, I wasn't, I was like, other people were getting these pretty high open rates. Mine was around 21%, maybe 19, which isn't that great. Mm. And, um, so he said like, what are you doing? Why is it so low? And I go, I don't know. And he's checking it out. He's like, Oh, uh, you're going to get spammed a lot because you're using Gmail as your email service. You're going to have to get your own, you know, Brandon at BrandonElseWrites.com or something like that. And that's what I did. I changed it to that. Got a new service for my email. It's a completely different service than Gmail, but it has my website name on it. Yeah. And I could not believe it. The next emails I was sending, 45% open rates, 49% Incredible. open. I never got over the 50%. But it just skyrocketed. It was like, what in the world? This is so much better. <laughs> and, and getting back to my original thought, or orig- the thing I was going to originally say, I, I write sci-fi archaeology. And I'm a history major in, in college. And I love archaeology. I love the past. I love researching it. And so what I do with my newsletter is I write archaeological newsletters with a sci-fi twist to him, to every single one, and, um, you know, kind of uh, like ancient alien stuff. Mm. And it's really fun, and <laughs> it's kind of like watching the History Channel Ancient Aliens, and not as good, but because I don't have all that time to, to spend <laughs> on my newsletter. But I, I, I either find articles and get permission from the article writer and put it on my, my uh, newsletter, send it to my, to my email list, or I write my own. My mm-hmm. own are usually the ones that get the most feedback, and, and it's a blast. Yeah, like one, I, except for one I just did on the scary, the coronavirus. I did a lot of research on that. I look at it every day because I was a sports therapist, and with sports therapy, you have to learn nutrition and, and pathology. You take pathology courses, and so there's an interest of that in me. And so I just wrote my take on it and uh, where I think it's leading and, and – um, and that also got a lot of open rates and people a lot of responses. And what's nice. great is that I have a very good email list. It's about 10,000. And the hard part is after I write an email to get back on my, my email and see so many replies because I want to reply to every single person and I'll have to spend hours. replying. <laughs> so, so, and every, and the only time I send out an and a newsletter now is when I'm swapping with somebody, when I'm sharing somebody's book. So I'll send out two to three newsletters a month. That's about mm-hmm. it. Um, and uh, sometimes four. So that's about all I do. Mm. It was interesting about the, uh, the, me- the mechanics of the actual email address itself and the impact that they had. Because I think yeah. something that... Uh, Unless you, email emails are a strange game because unless you really look into the mechanics of it, because I, I used to work a lot in uh, in marketing, so we used to have to look a lot into like the email campaign. And there are so many yeah. sort of basic tips. Like it struggles so much if you put things like free, exclusive. If you put things in block capital, spam filters, yes, yes. to remove those. So sometimes you have to be really deliberate and look at that kind of thing to try and yeah, you can rate. putting. I guess it gets flagged if you put free or exclusive yeah. on there. Is that correct? 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. I've been, uh, I think it was Chris who also helped me. I think he's told me not to do that. Mm. But then that's your temptation as a, as a writer, isn't it? To go, look at this exclusive release and try and shout it out. But obviously that's not. But when I did and it didn't get flagged, when I do the free, mm. uh, I looked because I look at my past open rates and those were very high open rates. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. How long ago um, was that? Is that still a thing that. <clears throat> oh, me. that was years ago. That, I think that's when I started. Like I, um, I had, a, a, gosh, maybe when I had 5,000 subscribers. Mm. Um, maybe two years or three years into my, my book world, my book career. Uh, and that's when I had, um, Oh, do you know convert kit? I think they're called. Yes. Convert yeah. It's like 150 bucks a month. I just couldn't do that anymore, <laughs> uh, but it, it's, it's a really good service. Mm. Um, uh, probably one of the best. Um, so, uh, but I can still go in and look at my convert kit stuff. Cause I still have the, you know, I'm, oh, it keeps you I history. don't pay for it anymore. Yeah. So it yeah. gives you a history. Nice. Yeah, so. What's your uh, relationship with vision boards? Definitely something that, um, Oh yeah. <laughs> Cause I spoke to you about that a little bit in Edinburgh. We had a little bit of chat about that and obviously you gave a little yeah. bit of on your talk and then. Okay. Fact, so I'll go on. So, uh, vision boards, do, do you want me to explain what they are first before I tell you? Yeah, probably worth. And, yeah, yeah. All right. Vision boards or the way I do vision boards, cause everybody does it differently. I do it, I, I, I find pictures on the internet and I do two things. So I find pictures on the internet, things that I strive for, that I'd want, like being in Bali, being in a tropical area, which happened, which was on my vision board. Um, uh, 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 being a successful author, like to me, that's for some reason, being a successful author is a picture of me or somebody lifting their arms towards a beaming sun. To me, that's success for some reason. Um, you know, somebody healthy and fit. I, I put things on my pictures on my vision board that I want to become or that I believe I can succeed in, um, uh, like a house that I want and all that jazz. You know, and I put like fifteen or twenty pictures up there, uh, and then I write out what's called uh, incantations or affirmations, but as if they've already happened. I put those next to the pictures, like. I make 20,000 a month or uh, I, f I, I write 5,000 words a day or uh, I, um, gosh, I publish a book every two months, that kind of thing. And, or I, I write uh, best selling, you know, all that stuff, stuff that you want to, you, or goals, goals of yours. And so I write that down. Um, and then I put, like, I have a picture of uh, the New York Times bestseller list, uh, the, um, the USA Today bestseller list, and Amazon bestseller, all that stuff. And, and, and it's quite a long list of things that I read out, but it'll only take me a minute to read these out. And I say it out loud. For some reason, if you say this out loud and you do in incantations with it, which incantations are different than affirmations. Incantations are you're, you're moving with your speech. And your, your speech is pretty high. You look like you're insane, really. And <laughs> um, you are, it, what it does, apparently, I learned this from Anthony Robbins. Uh, I used to work for, work for him. Um, it, it, is not that the only, Tony Robbins? Tony Robbins, yeah. And you still work um, for him? No, I used to. Oh, I used okay, to. interesting. Um, I, I started working for him when I was 19, and I worked for a year with him. And he's the real deal. He's okay. amazing. Um, anyway, so... I, you, when you do incantations, it kind of gets the brain and body synced in a lot more than just affirmations. I've heard. <laughs> I don't know if it's yeah. true. But it works for me. And this isn't some magic thing to where when you write your vision board and you read it every morning or read it every morning and every night, which I'd, I'd suggest do it twice a day, um, to get it just ingrained in your brain, to get the ritual there, to get the routine done, to get your your body, not your brain and your body, not just thinking this could happen, but you have a, a for sure, you know, this is going to happen. Um, these goals are going to take place in your life. Um, when you get to that point, that's when the vision board starts to uh, really work. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> uh, vision boards aren't these magical things that you create and suddenly it's going to come into your life. These to me are reminders Every time I read this in the morning, it's a reminder for me to take action 
for the steps I want to take to accomplish my goal. That's what it does for me. It's reminders. Um, and it's also confidence builder. It's strange how the more you do this, the more confidence you gain. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's kind of the vision board for me. <laughs> no, I love it. And I love how, uh, how fired up you got when you were talking about that as well. It's sort of reflective. Yeah, because uh, somebody, um, I wrote about a vision board on 20 bucks to 50K and it, uh, somebody on a podcast uh, talked about it. And uh, one, it was two people podcast. One person said, you know, you can't trust this. It's just magic. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And the other person's like, it's okay if it's woo woo, all this stuff. So, and I was like, <laughs> it's not, it's not why I'm doing it. It's not because of the woo woo. I'm not doing this because uh, I think that if I put a picture in front of me, it's going to magically appear. No, it takes hard work and action. And con cause if you have faith uh, in something, it goes nowhere if you don't take a step toward that, that faith. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I look at it. Mm. Flipping that around, have you ever had something that you've had on your list that you haven't quite achieved? And if so, how did you sort of react to that? Of course, there are some things that haven't happened yet. <laughs> mm. yeah. um, I, I have reached the 20,000 uh, a month mark. Um, and then I coasted. So after I reached that mark, I thought I made it. I thought, okay, People are going to, next book's going to be the same thing next week. No, I, no, that's not, uh, I, I still needed, I, I didn't advertise as much. I didn't do the newsletters. I didn't do the stuff that I should have done. So um, yes, the 20,000 a month a mark was reached. I wanted to continue that. So I'm going to try to get, I'm not going to try. I'm going to get back up to that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why 20,000 is such a big deal for me. But for some reason, that's, <laughs> that's the amount I want. Um, but the, with the 20,000, here's the thing that I did. I helped. Uh, what I enjoyed about it is I helped my dad lost his job and, um, and I had, I said, you know, dad, I have, I, I can give you like 10 grand right now. I can give you, I, I can help you and you can, until you get whatever. I have that opportunity. I also was able to, um, pay two of my friends who one got injured on the job and he didn't have a family that would help him out. And he, he, he was able to pay for rent for a couple months before he ran out of money and he was going to get evicted. He wasn't telling me. And, and I said, I can help you out on the fifth on. Usually you get till the fifth of the month and then you get that eviction notice on the fifth. He's just like, okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to borrow the money. I said, okay, no, no. Cause when I gift money, usually I don't get it back. So I said, no, <laughs> I'll, I'll, for, I'll just pay it forward. I'll give you the money. I'll pay for your rent. And then about, three or four months later, a similar situation happened to another friend. And so I was able to help pay them. Um, so anyway, that's what, uh, what making a lot of money can do. You can help mm. a lot of people. So uh, some of the things that didn't happen. Um, yeah. New York times bestseller list hasn't happened yet. USA today yet. Uh, the home, my dream home, it's in the process. That's why <laughs> the reason why I'm in Bali to save money for my dream home. Mm. Uh, uh, that is occurring. <laughs> the goal is, is, is in, is in, is on the horizon. So no, I yeah. love it. I love, I love just a single word can obviously just keep reinstilling that, that belief that it, it's going to happen. Yeah. Down the line. If it doesn't, oh, well, Create a different <laughs> you know, life yeah. goes on. So, How do you go yeah. about, um, because I've, I've experimented a bit with sort of meditation with, uh, I've got a vision board, um, which I need to sort of get a bit better at actually sort of bringing that and embracing that. Um, yeah. the, the one that I always struggle with, and it's something I have tried with is the affirmation because particularly when you live in a household with other people, yeah. affirmations or obviously <laughs> the other side of that incantations as well, they, like you say, they can come across quite, uh, I guess, theatrical, quite sort of, um, strange alien for, for people to be watching. How do you overcome that? I guess insecurity is, is all it is in terms of sort of like being able to be, I, I haven't that. overcome that insecurity. I go out into the garage and do it. Okay. Um, I put, I had my vision board out there on the wall. I had my um, affirmations, which I didn't really use. I would, after affirmations, I do incantations. Yep. So I'd, I'd take an affirmation and do an incantation with it. But I would, but again, incantation is a little bit different. Um, so the incantation I, is just the, the actual achievement of already having compared to the affirmation. Yeah, it, but, I will, or I am. But you say it in a different way. Um, uh, I would go out to a Tony, I would go on YouTube, go to a, um, a Tony Robbins video and type in Tony Robbins 
um, incantations, and it'll explain to you what it is. It's just a little bit different. It's worded differently, a little bit differently than affirmation. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's that. Um, with, uh, yeah, anyway, uh, yeah, I go out into the garage. Um, uh, it, I'm still embarrassed. I told um, Lotus and Liliana, my, my daughter and my partner Lotus, to, to leave because I'm too embarrassed to talk in front of them. <laughs> to you in front of them. Uh, so I have there, this my talking thing. I'm, I'm yeah. a better writer than I am a speaker. Oh, so, fair yeah. enough. Um, we are coming up to time, which is annoying because I have so many questions I want to ask. Um, one last question for me before we get into a couple of Patreon questions is, uh, why do you write? Oh. Um, I know you kind of said a couple of things throughout the interview, but... I, I think... Gosh, I don't know. I, I just love it. I, I think it's the whole creating a new world. Maybe that's it. I, I, um, there's every aspect about it I love. I love when, um, even when I get critiqued by, let's say, um, a review, that's, that's a, a, a good critique. You know, I get a one star, but it's actually a good one star. It's telling you what your issue is. And I love improving upon that. Um, so with writing, I think it's a continual improvement throughout your writing career. Um, uh, things you can work on, challenges you can meet, um, challenges you can best. Uh, what else is there? Uh, oh, man. I guess if I have something to say to the world, this is one way to say it. I guess um, somebody told me, because as a sports therapist, I enjoyed helping thousands of people get over things they never thought they could get over, changing their lives. Um, and, and I thought quitting that and going to an author, I was not helping the world out again, or not helping the world out like I was with sports therapy. Not that I was helping the world with sports therapy. I was changing some people's lives. Mm. Um, and then uh, a client of mine said, you, well, you could change more lives by writing. You know, you can, you're reaching more people. And I guess in a way, maybe that's another reason I do it. Maybe there's something I'm writing um, I'm entertaining somebody who maybe is in their hospital bed and they just need something. And maybe my book is there to help them and take their mind off their pain or something. So, so maybe that's one way. Um, I can't say that I'm, I'm writing anything political. Like if I write anything political, half the people will hate me, half the people will love me. So <laughs> it's, it's almost, I guess, if I want to write things political, maybe <laughs> Uh, I should write about less war because my sci-fi is always about <laughs> some type of battle <laughs> taking place because I'm kind of anti-war like a lot of people. Mm. Um, I would rather not have war, have peace than war. So um, again, but there's no drama in there <laughs> if you're writing sci-fi. So, so um, yeah, I guess in some way I can reach other people and entertain people. I guess that's another reason why I, uh, nice. I'm writing. Mm. Okay, so into the Patreon questions now. These have been sent over by the lovely people at www.patreon.com forward slash great writers share. Uh, and the first one is from Jen Mitchell, um, who firstly says she's super stoked that you're on the show. Brendan is truly one of my Hi, favorite Jen. people. Uh, Hi, Jen. <laughs> and she says, have you been able to push through the hard stuff and keep writing? Um, it's the kind of thing we all face and you seem to remain so positive and genuine. So what's the secret? Uh, the secret is not showing when I'm negative. Uh, uh, I've... I've gone to the point of, um, but it only lasts for like an hour. I have this thing in me that if I'm down, my brain or my mind will start changing gears and going to a solution. Um, but I've been to the point that was like, you know, I, I, I screwed up with this. I now make less money than I did as a sports therapist. I should try to go back to being a sports therapist. It's much easier money. Uh, I, I was making a great living doing that. And this is a lot harder. I know that kind of stuff that, that pops up in my mind quite a bit, or I suck at writing. People think I'm a crap writer, all that. So, uh, then I'll, within an hour, I'll pick myself back up. I'll go back to, you got to go back to incantations or whatever helps you stay positive in order to, I guess, keep going. Um, or read a book that's really well written and be like, okay, I'll learn from this book. And, like one book that I keep going back to, if I feel like I'm not a very good writer, I go back to a book written by Nick Cole and Jason Ansbach. Um, they wrote a book called Legionnaire. Mm. I've read that book so many times. Um, I think it improves my writing. And if Nick Cole and Jason Ansbach read my work, 
I apologize if you <laughs> if it's my work is not as even close to yours and but I'm kind of uh, but I'm trying to get to your level Jason Onspach and Nicole so mm. so um, that's one thing I do I read that book a lot mm. um, I also read uh, Hugh Howey's book I think that's a well written book uh, is that Wolf Wolf mm. Wolf yeah um, I'm currently reading. A.G. Riddle's newest, or not newest, uh, I think his newest is this, this like world, uh, ice world, I forget what it's called. Um, but I just read a, a portion of it yesterday, I should know, but I, I, I read A.G. A. G. Riddle's books and I think he's a fabulous writer as well. Mm. So yeah, um, yeah. actually, uh, if anybody can read, uh, um, two people, uh, Jackson Dean Chase, and William Van Winkle, he goes by uh, Bodhi St. John. Uh, they aren't as selling as well, but wow, those two can write. They are incredible writers. So, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, and for listeners, anyone who's interested in uh, finding out a bit more about Nick Cole, because he's a really interesting guy. He, I have um, an episode in which myself and Luke spoke to him on my old podcast, The Story Studio, and he gives some incredible nuggets of wisdom. Um, he's a drama guy as well, so he's, very, he's a, a very, very good talker too. He's an um, incredible speaker, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's a great guy. Uh, John Cronshaw, um, another comment to start with, which is he's thankful for your mentorship. He really... Uh, oh, that guy's really awesome. Helps. Yes. <laughs> uh, and he sort of credits you a lot for the success of his recent fantasy series, um, The Ravenglass Chronicles. Uh, and he asks, how do you research the market for your series? I'm continually asking other authors. I'm in several sci-fi groups, um, and I'm getting a lot of information from them. Uh, and we all know, I'm not going to give the sci-fi authors out, but we all know them very well. And um, uh, I have a group of eight that I'm in and another group of eight that I'm in. And we're, it's kind of a mastermind group and we're, we talk shop. And uh, I'm also in 20 books to 50K Pacific Northwest group and we talk shop in there as well. So I'm constantly keeping my eyes and ears open. Mm. So I guess that's what I'm, con- I'm doing. Because it's, it's ridiculous how quickly things change. Something that worked a year ago is not working today. It's, I wish that wasn't the case because it would be so much easier. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely something I think is reflected across uh, all, all organizations and businesses just part of the um, growing rapidity of how people are trying yeah. to digest information and with, move quickly in life. That's new to me because with sports therapy, it was all, you know, you're a good sports therapist, so it's word of mouth. Who should I go to? And somebody mm. went to me and they, you know, it, that's just how it grows. I guess it can grow like that with books too, with readers. Mm. Um, but it, with marketing, it's just constantly changing with books. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mark McClure asks, how do you go about improving your writing craft skills? I think you touched on I this read, a little bit. I read um, craft books almost every day and I used to read them every day. Here in Bali, it's a little bit different because I'm more on, I feel like I should be on vacation. So after yeah. I write, instead of doing what I'm supposed to be, what I would do at home, which is reading uh, a couple chapters in a craft book, I'm like with my family. I'm like, oh, we got to go here. We got to go there. That kind of thing. <laughs> so so I, I feel like, you know, we're going to be here for six months or we're going to be here for probably five more or four more months. And um, uh, so I imagine that's kind of what it's going to be mm-hmm. until I get back. Nice. Uh, he also asked, how relevant has your author website been to your success? Oh, gosh, Tara, I, I don't even. I was just thinking today that I need to go and actually update it because I'm about five or six books behind, maybe more. I just hate websites. I, <laughs> I need to hire somebody to do them. Um, I just don't even think about it. So my newsletter is what people know me by. Um, the website, I never, ever with a newsletter, nobody contacts me and says, your news, your website's not updated or um, I went to your website or anything like that. Mm. But I don't know if people are actually visiting it from my books and looking at it and be like, oh, this is crap <laughs> and not joining my newsletter. So I, I need to pay more attention to it because it probably is worth its weight in gold. Mm. I should probably get to it. Well, it definitely seems to be, uh, particularly when you start a need for people to put the websites up there and have something. But I know quite a lot of people that just can't keep up with the maintenance and it's, it's a lot. But That's yeah, the thing. I, and the last website I did, here's another reason why I don't like doing it. I, I would post all my newsletter articles on my website and I would keep it up to date and I would 
do all this wonderful stuff, a hacker got to it and destroyed oh. it. And to the point that um, uh, Bluehost said that they're, I, they'll charge me this much money to fix it. And so uh, I went around and people were like, yeah, it's, it's pretty hard to fix. And so I, had a, I went to a new host and created a new website. And I was like, I just, I don't post any articles on there anymore. I just post, mm. post my books. and I haven't even done that. Fair. Fantastic. Uh, so now we are going into the quick fire round, which is the moment everyone's been waiting for. Uh oh, here we and go. It's ten questions. <laughs> I'll throw it at you as quickly as possible. Um, answer them as quickly as you can, but there's no pressure. It's just a bit of fun. Uh, okay, are you ready? I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Star Wars or Firefly? Firefly. What's your favorite planet? Tatooine, even though that's Star Wars. <laughs> is there other intelligent life out there? Yes. What's the worst piece of advice you've ever received? Somebody told me not to write and that I was the worst writer. What are you currently reading? <laughs> um, A.G. Riddle's... Uh, I can't remember the name. Uh, favorite color? Orange. If you're trapped in a bubble at the bottom of the sea, what one item would you request to help you escape? Oxygen tank with a, <laughs> connected to a mask so I can pop out of the bubble and float or swim to the surface. Do you prefer writing or editing? Um, writing. What is your proudest work to date? Star Guild, the one I'm working on right now. What's a song that you just couldn't get out of your head? Oh, Walking on Sunshine. Nice. Uh, and that's 10 questions. One bonus question is where can my listeners find out everything about you and all that you're working on? My newsletter? <laughs> <laughs> I guess go to Brandon Ellis Writes, Brandon Ellis Writes dot com. You will see a link to the newsletter and you can, you can go on there. Um, I'm also doing um, Bailing to Bali, uh, kind of a little do mini documentary. I post one, one, about, uh, one a month about my experience in Bali and my writing experience here. I'm trying to show how to become, uh, to show how you can be a six-figure author in a year. So anyway, I did it last year and I want to do it this year. Nice. And congratulations on that. Um, oh, thank and thank you. you. Thank you so much for joining me. Everything that you mentioned, I'll stick in the show notes as links that people can access. Um, but yeah, no, I appreciate you coming on the show and talking to me, Brandon. Yeah, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. No worries. And thank you everyone for listening and I will see you next week. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Great Writer Share podcast. Next week, I'll be joined by the dynamic duo behind the Unstoppable Authors podcast, HB Line and Angeline Trevenant. Don't forget you can get early access to every episode of the Great Writer Share podcast and the chance to ask upcoming guests any of your questions just by becoming a patron of the show. All you need to do is visit www.patreon.com forward slash Great Writer Share and support the show for as little as $1 a month. One more time, that's www.patreon.com forward slash Great Writer Share. Until next time.